Thank you for coming. I, I recognise that this subject is different to most of the other subjects that are being discussed at this conference. And there's a reason for that. Um, my name is Suzanne Rain, and I worked for 24 years in British government, in the British Foreign Office, and I was head of the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre for nearly three years, 2015 to 17. And I'm joined by Professor, do you want to introduce yourself, Mike? I can do. Why don't you? Thanks. Uh, my name is Mike Goodman, I'm a Professor of Intelligence and International Affairs in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Um, has spent quite a lot of time looking at warning, looking at the role of history and working, being seconded into the British government in various guises. And we start, oh look, we've got more people. More come people. In, come in. Oh no, the rest don't want to. No, no, they've changed their minds. <laughs> they're somewhere. They're the artists. Oh, they're the artists. Okay. We'll leave them all going. That's people speaking. Yeah. No, they're, they're doing the uh, cartoons. And I'm the graphic reporter, so I'm just going to sit So you're going to draw us? Uh, no. no, she's going to draw a, the, the a map of oh, the concept. Yeah. Oh, dear. Okay. Um, so, when I left the civil service, the pandemic started, and I realised that a lot of the processes that I had been applying, or we had been applying, on terrorism, basically monitoring, uh, monitoring changes, warning, communicating, protecting, preparing, weren't being followed across all sorts of different aspects of the national risk. And so I, I became connected with Karina and Ilan here, and I started to think about whether there are where there are aspects of the warning discipline that is used for weather and volcanoes and floods that you guys are all talking about all the time, whether aspects of warning discipline can be applied to geopolitics. So this presentation that Mike and I have, have come up with is a little bit <laughs> experimental because it's, a, it's the process of thinking what works and what doesn't work and how might we, how what might we inform better warning in geopolitics. That's the thinking behind it, and it's really much a, a work in progress, so engage with us as we start off. So, oh God, Mike. Is it the other clicker? I can't find another clicker. Oh, it's now stuck. Where okay, so, so the questions I started with is, what does, a, what does the UK's warning system look like for foreign and national security? Is there a warning system? And if there is, what does it look like? And then moving from the, the sort of no natural disasters thing that you have in natural disaster world, is there such a thing as an, avoid, an unavoidable geopolitical disaster? Can they, in theory, be avoided just like floods and volcanoes you can't avoid them but you can avoid the disaster that comes with them and how might it be improved so to, to do that i'm sorry about this I, uh, this is from karina friendman so one of the first things you need to do if you're going to say well how how might you avoid a geopolitical disaster is you have to understand what a warning system looks like for other kinds of disasters. And this is a discipline which again might be to the disaster community, disaster risk reduction community. This is completely familiar to you, but it's definitely not completely familiar to people who work in foreign policy because they don't think about things like that. But what does a warning system require? This is a slide that I took from Karina Fernley. It requires a selection of indicators about whatever it is that it is you're worried about. It requires monitoring of indicators, and then a process of issuing a warning, communicating the warning, so process of deciding to warn, process of communicating the warning, and then the three sort of totally separate but really important aspects of the warning mechanism, which is hearing the warning, receiving it, believing it, and acting on it. And and so I would I would put it to you that and we're, we're going to discuss this in a lot of depth, but in most aspects of 
foreign policy, of geopolitics. Some parts of this are there a bit, some parts are simply not there at all. So the selection of indicators does happen. You know, we'll talk a bit more about that. People do identify what it is they're worried about. Monitoring of indicators happens in certain areas where the, where the threat is really clear. Issuing the warning is a sort of triangle like this. Issuing the warning happens only in very, very specific areas. And then, and then the, the sort of bits at the bottom, receiving the warning, act, leaving the warning, acting on the warning. We're going to give you some really clear examples of how difficult that is. Actually, you can take the evacuation of Afghanistan is a really good example of, you know, when was the warning sounded, who believed it, who didn't believe it, why did nobody do anything? So, so those are the sort of issues that, that I think I you know, want to sort of look at it scientifically almost and say, how many of these apply and where are they? Where are they actually applied? So selecting and monitoring indicators. Some of this, so Mike and I, we come from a completely different world. So some of this is, uh, it might be oversimplified. It might not have enough information depending on what your own disciplines are. But, but governments, which generally do foreign national security policy, they have <coughs> processes to work out what it is you're worried about and where you might collect information about them from. And so if you say, wh where, where, would, where would a government get information about a threat from? And the answer is, of course, a wide range of areas. So there's an awful lot, almost far too much, and that's part of the problem, of openly available information about what's going on in the world. That's known as open source. Social media, Twitter, it's just full of stuff. The problem with that is it's impossible to know what's true and what isn't. So it requires an awful lot of work. Then you have reporting from, from your own networks, whatever they are. So a, a, an infrastructure that essentially reports into government. And that can be embassies, consulate, high commissions. The military has a very wide network of bases around the world. It has a huge number of allies and partner organizations, some of whom there are sort of formal agreements to share information, some of whom it's less formal, but it happens. There are multilateral organizations such as NATO, UN, EU, all of which are sharing information all the time about understanding of what's going on in, in, in every aspect of what's going on. Then you have specific collection of information about the threats that you're watching. And I always find it quite helpful to think of a volcano. Basically, you're, you're, you're putting the sensors all around it, and some of those sensors are more sophisticated than others. And that collection of specific information, whether through human sources, whether through technical sources, and a very wide range of difficult, different technical options, which includes imagery and intercept, or you're surrounding whatever it is you're worried about, the threat, the threat country, the threat actor, with, with sort of sensors, which will give you an indication of how, how it's operating. Um, the critical thing is that this is where the parallel with a volcano, I think, works very well, because you can identify a problem. You can say, we know Russia is a problem. And we can surround it with sensors. But there's always this intangible bit that you can't quite pick up, whatever the sensors are. You can't quite know what what's going to happen and when and 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 the aim is to just collect as many different indicators as you can to put yourself in the best possible opportunity to do it so that's that's in a nutshell how it kind of works and what are you looking at so there is a process which all governments will go through which says what are we most worried about what's going to if, if we're clear about what what we want the world to look like what are the things that are going to put us off course and the first and most important are, are actors, <laughs> which is which is seen often states look at other states and say, well, you know, we're the United Kingdom here and the states we're concerned about most are you know, typically Russia, China, Iran. Um, you know, then there's a whole load of other things like non-state actors, individuals, uh, so individual terrorists, non-state armed groups. Um, Al-Qaeda is a classic example of that. But within, so, so those groups often sit within a broader thing, which 
in the UK system has been known as countries at risk of instability. So places where bad stuff might happen because of uh, a whole set of things, because of unstable governments, either very strong governments or very weak governments, both of which cause a lot of instability because of um, climatic conditions, because of um, you know lack of resources, all these things create heightened sense of risk. And the other thing that you need to have to inform what you're watching is, is an understanding of where you, i.e. the country that you're responsible for, I suppose, is vulnerable. So, for example, the UK has a very, very active population, bless you, very active population which travels a lot. So, you know, large numbers of Britons go overseas, mostly in the summer, but not exclusively, to, to places where they are more likely to, to come up against either a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, a coup, a terrorist attack, a, you know, whatever. And so, so knowing where they are, where you are most likely to have to help people. For example, uh, we had lots of problems in Kenya where there was, when there was very uh, heightened level of terrorist threat in Kenya, and we had a lot of British tourists, particularly holidaying on the coast in Kenya. And so you was constantly sort of trying to work out, is it safe, is it not safe? What role does the embassy or the high commission in this case, what role does it have in warning people? That's the sort of thing you think about. But obviously, all governments have limited resources. The world is massive. Bad things could happen anywhere at any time. So, so you can't watch everything. And so there has to be a process of prioritising what it is you're most concerned about and how you're going to put the resources that you have, the monitoring resources, onto the things that matter. So... Lord Toby Harris, just before, talked about the new UK National Risk Register 2023 edition. And that, as they always do, risk registers, lists a whole load of bad stuff that might happen. And I'm only showing you this slide just to give you an example of um, a couple of different aspects. So here you have terrorism and cyber and state threats, just to give you an idea of how governments think about these things. There's different processes within government that will address these in different ways. But it's it's about thinking about threats and about attacks. Mighty terrorist attackers, where, how, what kind of what kind of venue, what kind, you know, might it happen in transport, might it happen in uh, an aeroplane, might it happen, might there be hostage taking? Uh, how are we gonna how are we gonna provide warning for that so that we can stop it happening? Because the critical difference between the volcano and, and terrorism is that in theory you can stop the terrorist attack from happening you can't stop the volcano from erupting but if you get it right with the warning and the prevention you can stop the terrorist attack from happening that's i put it to you similarly with cyber attacks and with state threats there's an awful that's that's really only an abbreviation but just so you have an idea that this is the way government thinks about things so the uk does have this is British centric, other countries will do it differently. But the UK does have a system of geopolitical warning to some extent. So it it goes through a process of agreeing what threats it considers to be greatest. And it then goes through a process of prioritizing those and allocating resources against the highest priorities. That work will go on internally, it's not published, doesn't need to be published, shouldn't be published. And then analytical bodies across governments are delegated the responsibility of either, of, of monitoring those threats based on all the information which comes in from multiple different comes in from agencies, but it also comes in from open source. Yes, please. Can I ask a clarification yeah. question? So the terrorist uh, threat is just one example of a geopolitical threat, and then yes. broader class. Exactly. So, 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 I say non-state actors. Non-state actors can be all sorts of things. It can be a cyber hacking group. It can be terrorists who want to blow up Manchester Arena. Uh, it can be the Russian state that wants to assassinate somebody in Salisbury. You know, it it, it can be. Um, you know, build up of terrorists 
groups in Tunisia that's going to attack a beach in Tunisia. So, so it doesn't have to be an attack to the UK. It can be an attack somewhere else. Um, and it can be a geopolitical act. It can be one country attacking another. And that's what we're going to talk about in more detail in a minute. But basically, you identify all those things that you don't want to happen. And then you say, well, how, you know, who's going to collect information on them and how much resource do they need? And then you have to, resources are always limited, so it has to be prioritised. And risk, you have to accept, obviously, a level of, a different level of risk against different threats. That's really hard to do. It's really hard to do scientifically. I mean, you can't do it scientifically, really, I don't think. And then some of these threats are monitored by designated bodies responsible for monitoring them. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Then, and Mike again, Mike is sort of expert on this, there is a central point where the understanding of this system and the running of this system sits. And in the UK, that's the Cabinet Office, uh, which is essentially at the, at the heart of all the government departments. And within that, you have National Security Secretariat, which is the Policy Act part, and you have the Joint Intelligence Organization, which does the assessments and analysis, which provides the assessments to inform decisions that are taken at a National Security Council meeting, for example. And the, I, mean, I realize that I'm describing an architecture which some of you will be very familiar with and some of you will never have heard of, but the, the critical meeting is a meeting called the Joint Intelligence <coughs> Committee, which meets once a week, to agree collective assessments of the level of threat on whatever the topical issues are. The, the, the really important point that is where I think Mike and I feel that we've been very stimulated by engaging with the warning community is for most geopolitical events, and think about Afghanistan because it's a really clear and easy example, there is no formal warning system. There is simply a, a narrative observation of a, of a deteriorating problem. So this is, I've tried to draw this now in a, I'm not very good at these things. So I've drawn it as well as I can based on my own skills. And I'm looking forward later to seeing this in a different form. But I try to say, so in the middle of this, the Joint Intelligence Committee, which has a strategic warning function, i.e. It's, it's there to provide a strategic warning but no warning mechanism through which it does that. Other bodies monitor specific risks and do have formal warning functions that, 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 it, that they operate. And for me, I'm speaking from personal experience, the Joint Terrorism and Analysis Centre runs independent of any influence, the national terror threat level. So, so the, it monitors the terrorism threat across different sectors, different parts of the world, and if it sees that the threat is changing, it changes the threat level accordingly. And that is issued to ministers who communicate it to the public. It's also communicated immediately to the responders, whether that is the Foreign Office, if it's an overseas issue, or whether it's the police in the UK. So that, I think, in, in if you're looking at the model of a warning system, the joint how terrorism works, it fits within that tradition of a warning system that Ilan would, would recognise. Defence intelligence sits in, inside the MOD. It's a significant, I mean, by which I mean it is, it is a large number of people who are analysing indicators across all the threats that are delegated to the Ministry of Defence to watch, which includes you know, nuclear warning and um, other kind of serious alarms that might be sounded. And that, ha and I'm not. I know that there are people from defence intelligence watching this. I'm not going to go into any detail about any of that, but just to say that they have a delegated responsibility for warning, and they operate warning systems on those areas. The National Cyber Security Centre was set up to monitor and analyse the threats of cyber attack from malicious cyber actors, and that has a an uh, analytical function to understand and attribute cyber attacks and it's communicating constantly with the general public with businesses about how those threats are changing but big geopolitical events a tsunami coming out of nowhere there is no formal warning warning mechanism for that issuing the warning 
this is the bit, so that's a picture from MI5's website. That's the description of the terrorism threat level sort of system. It's, it has the, the, the national level one has five levels. There are sector level ones, for example, for aviation, rail transport, critical national infrastructure. They're all done uh, separately with the bodies who are responsible for them. If you think of the aviation sector being a community that might be inundated. So the, commun the communications are direct there. But the, the, the really, for me, the really important bit is in this process, which you can't see, the listening and believing and acting on the warning is baked into it. So that, so that network of stakeholders, the conversations are happening all the time so that when there is an attack, you know, you know who you need to warn and they know what they're going to do when they get the warning. Similarly, Foreign Office knows that if a threat level changes for a country, they are it's their responsibility to take action on that warning. Their action usually takes the form of a change in their travel advice. So you will see, you won't see the stuff behind the scenes that, that is saying we're raising a threat level. This is an extreme example, but you know, if you can you can look on the government website, you can see travel advice to each country, and that is based on threat levels that are set by um, in this case. Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre, but I mean there are there are all sorts of other things that feed into this. I'm not saying it's solely based on those threat levels, but if the threat levels change, this won't automatically change, but it probably will. And that responsibility for those decisions sits with the Foreign Office, and they know it does. And that's the critical thing that they know it does. So, so the warning is communicated, and people still travel to really dangerous places and expect to be rescued, but that's another matter. So what about geopolitical events we were talking about? This is, again, this is from the government website. This is the role of the Joint Intelligence Committee, the bit sits in the middle. And you'll see here, point two, its role is to monitor and give early warning of development of direct and indirect threats and opportunities in those fields to British interests or policies and to the international community as a whole. So that's a great intention. But how do you do it if you don't have a warning system, is the question. And we're going to come on to look at some examples where it works and doesn't. And for me, that's because, and I mean, this is the warning community's big problem. And it was, it was a question that was raised in there. You know, if you give an early warning, can you affect the outcome? And Catalina, I think, tried to give some examples where an early warning save people. It's really hard to show that your early warning was the thing that rescued everybody because it looks like a false alarm. And particularly in geopolitics, the risk is that you're accused constantly of crying wolf because you say we need to do if, if you say we need to do something and somebody does something, the bad thing doesn't happen. And and trying to sort of quantify that is really hard. Part of the problem is fuzzy thinking about intelligence and the role of intelligence and how intelligence can be right or wrong. And I find that it really helps to think about it in, in terms of past and present and future. So if you're talking about the past and the present, it is, I'm sure there'll be some philosophers who'll disagree with this, but I think it is possible to talk about correct and incorrect. Because you're, you're I mean, and the really clear example, does Saddam Hussein have weapons of mass destruction? The intelligence was wrong, but it was wrong because it could have been right. The answer was yes or no. He did or didn't have them. If you're talking about the future, there isn't a right or wrong. Will Putin invade Ukraine? The answer is, well, it entirely depends on what happens next. It depends on how we influence his risk calculations. It depends. It's never, it's never just the aggressor because the aggressor is... Is also has a victim. So, so if we if we're talking about will Iran, you know, make a nuclear bomb, a critical part of the answer has to be well, well, what do we think America is going to do? What do we think you know, the European Union is going to do? Because that's a, that's a constant dialogue with the threat actor in a way. So, separating out analysis of past and present from analysis of future 
is something that I think people often struggle with. And they'll say things like, well, the intelligence was wrong on Iraq, so why should we believe it on the Ukraine? And they fundamentally misunderstand the difference between questions of fact and questions of intent. Mike, over to you. So Mike's going to give some examples about questions of intent, aren't he? Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Slides. Um, where has the system come from? Suzanne showed on the uh, Joint Intelligence Committee's terms of reference this one for early warning. That came about in 1983 after the Falklands War when the government was surprised and the intelligence community did not predict that the Argentine government would invade. Actually, if you go back 40 years all the way to the start of World War II and uh, Churchill coming to power and the, and the way in which Norway was overrun by the Nazis almost immediately, Churchill's question back then was, who is the bit in government that should tell me if something's going to happen? Who is my intelligence chief to give me warning? And there was no answer. And actually, it took 42 years before that was formally written into a term of reference. But as Suzanne says, there's no formal mechanism within that. So what was done instead? Um, if we go back and look at the Cold War, and I'm, I'm going to give you on the next few slides two examples in a bit more detail. There were really two systems that existed within the government for warning about what was going to happen. The first of them was um, indicators and warnings, and this was very much a defence responsibility. And the idea was that the Soviet Union in the Cold War was a very, very hard intelligence target, very hard to gather accurate intelligence, very hard to know what the, the, the leader in the Kremlin might be thinking. So how could you work out what they were doing? For defence, and here's an example of one page of that, you could come up with very, very specific defence-related things that you could observe. Uh, and each of these, in a sense, you could observe often through uh, not particularly sensitive intelligence, but through various different means. And if you notice one of them on its own, it wouldn't necessarily tell you. But the whole idea behind indicators and warnings was that as soon as you saw a sufficient number of them, if they were metaphorically flashing red, you might suggest that something was about to happen. And that was really very divorced through much of the Cold War with uh, the Joint Intelligence Committee, which Suzanne has explained which had the responsibility for the threat. And the threat was based on two elements, predicting intentions and monitoring capabilities. And, and we could spend much more time thinking about both of these and the relationship between uh, monitoring capabilities, which was often a technical concern, and predicting intent, which was very much a political concern. And how did you bring those two elements um, together? And the short answer is, it was tremendously difficult. And by the middle part of the Cold War, in effect, the intelligence community works out that what was required was having a very effective crisis response mode because it was so difficult to predict if things were going to happen. And there were very elaborate procedures for how do you react to a crisis once the klaxon goes off, as opposed to necessarily being able to uh, predict it. But at the same time, you had to have a system. The, the, the Soviet nuclear threat was the number one concern for... For, for many, many governments. Uh, and so as part of that, to have a system for monitoring that, uh, Britain, the United States and Canada set up something called the tripartite alert system. And the idea was to have a very technically elaborate system so that if one of those countries got wind of the fact that the Russians were mobilizing, they could send that alert very, very quickly to the others. The fourth element on the slide, the Deputy Chief of Warning was a very short lived um, response to the Falklands War, very short-lived response to this idea that the Joint Intelligence Community should have a responsibility for warning by having an individual that was sitting in the Joint Intelligence Committee to have responsibility for warning. Um, and that individual, the very first one, as far as I'm aware, the only one that ever had that title in the early 80s, proved to be very, very important almost instantly because they were the one that spotted uh, the Able Archer exercises and the fact that the Russians in 1983 had reacted to those in a very odd way uh, and had actually thought they were going to be real. So that individual who was there for a very short period of time did spot that and thought it was very, very effective. So um, let me give you two examples in a little bit more detail and then I'll pass back to Zan. And these are quite different examples. The first one you could argue is an example of an intelligence success. The second one is an example of an intelligence failure. And actually, if you look at the academic literature around intelligence failure, surprise attack, warning failure, it's vast. It goes all the way back to Pearl Harbor in the early part of the Second World War. Uh, and how do you watch out for something going wrong? And of course, when something goes wrong, it's very, very obvious. 
uh, in the old days, something would get blown up. Now with cyber attacks, it's a bit more difficult, but it would be very obvious to spot if something had happened to then go backwards and say, why did we not see this coming? Examples of success are much more difficult. And as this one will highlight, I think, because you're right, almost invariably something doesn't happen. So how do you know that it was your intervention that meant that you'd got it right? And the background to this one goes back to the late 1950s. In 1958, the Iraqi royal family was overthrown in a very bloodthirsty coup. You can find photographs online of their, their, their bodies being dragged through the streets. And the military government that took over, which really paved the way for Saddam Hussein uh, a couple of decades later, one of the things they argued was that Kuwait, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the map, um, should historically belong to Iraq. And again, much like Saddam Hussein in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, they tried to argue that it was part of Iraq and it should reabsorb it. For Britain at this time in the late 50s, that posed a problem. Uh, in the late 1950s, Britain got most of its oil from Kuwait, something like 55, 60 percent. There was a defensive agreement with the uh, the ruler in Kuwait, whereby if he formally requested Britain's defensive support, we were uh, agreed by a by a treaty to come to his aid. And so for Britain's intelligence community in the late 1950s, watching what the Iraqis were doing, where they were very publicly declaring an intent to reabsorb Kuwait was a number one concern for the region. But there was a problem and the problem came from the military and the military and the chiefs of staff said, if the Iraqis invade Kuwait because of defensive uh, commitments elsewhere, the British military cannot get them back out again without a full scale war, which is politically inconceivable. So they argued and they gave a formal requirement to the intelligence community to have four days advance notice of any Iraqi attacked Kuwait, which in the way that these things work is a, was a very straightforward, very formal, very standard sort of request. We've got four day, a minimum of four days advance notice. And in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, uh, the intelligence community looked at what the Iraqi military leadership was saying publicly, had a variety of secret sources that were providing uh, different types of intelligence and, and looked at this threat. And in the summer of 1961, there was what was thought to be at the time very good, reliable intelligence to suggest that the Iraqis were mobilizing, were sending tank convoys down towards Kuwait. And this was received in London, the Joint Intelligence Committee, which Suzanne mentioned, uh, looked at this and concluded in its assessment, this is a direct threat to Kuwait and something needs to be done. And that intelligence was passed to the Prime Minister, the Defence Secretary, uh, all of whom agreed this was a threat. The in information was passed to the leader in Kuwait who formally requested military support. And almost overnight, something like 10,000 uh, troops, equipment and other things were sent to the region before any attack took place to forestall this attack. And guess what happened? There was no attack. And it led to lots of questions afterwards. Why was Britain sending its forces there? Was this an example of imperial might, protecting oil supplies, uh, getting involved in uh, Middle Eastern politics in a way that it did not need to get involved? There are other bits to do this with in terms of the intelligence agencies not being avowed and not being able to release uh, reveal any of the information. The footnote to this is that at the time it was thought to be a great intelligence success. Clear requirement good collected intelligence, good analysed intelligence, the right decision was made and the events which everyone had feared had been forestalled. The other footnote to this um, is that we actually don't know now because of the records whether the Iraqis were ever going to invade or not. It, it, it's simply not known. But certainly at the time it was thought that that was uh, the case. The other threat I'm going to talk about is uh, is in the 1960s and it relates to the Soviet threat to Czechoslovakia. And you may know how this ends, so um, it gives the game away slightly. Uh, and this goes back to a sort of long-standing commitment of the Joint Intelligence Committee, which annually would produce a report with the classic title, Warning of a Soviet Attack on the West. And with very few examples uh, where there were very well-placed human sources through the Cold War, it was tremendously difficult to try and work out what the Soviet leader in the Kremlin was actually thinking or doing. Very hard to understand them, very hard to gather intelligence. 
very hard to sort of mentally understand from a from a London based perspective how someone sitting in the Kremlin looking west might see the world compared to how we sitting in London looking east might see the world. A, a huge problem. And uh, and Putin is very much part of that same concern. So how then did the intelligence community do it? Well, there were three elements to any assessments which they were producing at the time. How could you gauge intent? How could you look at what Stalin or Khrushchev or Brezhnev or any of their successors, how could you really understand what they wanted if you had no direct intelligence to reveal what they were saying? And that was tremendously difficult. The second element, which was slightly more straightforward was monitoring capabilities you could look at planes you could you could look at their technical abilities you could uh, look at the missiles that were producing being produced you could gather intelligence on nuclear weapons development so you could monitor the capabilities but the difficulty was bringing those two together in terms of a, a holistic assessment of what does the russian mindset reveal to us and those were tremendously difficult and there were very few examples of where that was uh, entirely known in the 1960s, the country which became a concern uh, and became an intelligence priority was Czechoslovakia. You'll notice here that the, the colours are the wrong way around on the key, but you'll get the sense. Um, and Czechoslovakia, which you see on the map, was very much at the sort of front line of the Cold War, arguably, between East and West, was going through a bit of a renaissance period in the uh, starting in the early 1960s. And in 1963, a new party boss, Dubček, who became Time magazine Man of the Year, um, took over. And Dubček was of great interest both in East and West. Uh, he was a communist, no question about that, but he was much more of a liberalising communist than the old-fashioned Stalinist type. And Dubček um, did a number of things which both alarmed the East and brought some uh, relief to the West. He, he relaxed the uh, control of the press over what was being said. He relaxed some of the control of the economy so people could begin to make a, a bit of money and a bit of profit and stuff. And there grew up in the mid-1960s this question for Britain's Joint Intelligence Committee. What will the Russians do about him? If the argument is that the whole aim of the Soviet Empire at that time was worldwide communist uh, takeover, then he was seen to be the man to do that. He was popular, his posters were up in school children's bedroom walls, and he was seen to be the man that could bring communism to the world. But at the same time, intelligence was suggesting that a number of the hardline eastern states, and you can see some of them on the board, were very unhappy with him because he was so different to what they believed in. And there was some intelligence to suggest that those leaders were putting pressure on Brezhnev, the Soviet leader, to do something about him. And so there began to grow up this slightly contrasting intelligence about what the Russians might or might not do to get a control over him compared to the fact that he was very, very popular amongst uh, communist youth and seemed to be the man to export communism um, around the world. And in the summer of 65, and in the summer of 66, and in the summer of 67, sounds like a Brian Adams song, there were Warsaw Pact exercises around the periphery of Czechoslovakia. And the question was, what did these exercises mean? Now, the key point about the Joint Intelligence Committee is that it's based on consensus. So the different uh, bits of the government, the intelligence community and, and the civil service departments, not politicians, who sit around the Joint Intelligence Committee, when they produce a report, when it gets sent out around government, it's based on the fact that they all have to agree to what it says. And we can come back to that afterwards if people are interested. And in 1967, there arose a problem. After a Warsaw Pact exercise, where many of the Soviet uh, military were still in the region, there was this question, what does this Warsaw Pact exercise mean? It's different to anything we've seen before. It's got more people involved. It's got different types of equipment involved. What does it mean? And there was no real answer to that. And in the summer of 68, the Warsaw Pact exercise that took place then was significantly bigger, significantly different to anything that had ever been held before. And in the Joint Intelligence Committee, an argument rose up between the military and the foreign office analysts. And the military said, while this is an exercise, we don't think it's just an exercise. We think the forces which have remained around the periphery of Czechoslovakia after the exercise ended, something like 25,000 troops that remained around the border of Czechoslovakia. The military said, we don't think this is an exercise. We think these people are here for something else. We just don't know what. And the foreign office analysts said, 
the Russians will not invade. It would be political suicide for them to invade because Dubček is so popular. And if they squash what he is trying to do in that country, it will send out such a negative reaction worldwide that it will stop any of these progressive movements. And so for the Joint Intelligence Committee, the challenge was, how do you bring together these two almost contrasting uh, assessments based on different kinds of information and different viewpoints into a single assessment? And this is what the Joint Intelligence Committee came up with in the summer of 68. While the possibility of Soviet military intervention cannot be altogether excluded, we consider it unlikely. Which I think is not a bad assessment, although it doesn't really tell you what's going to happen. We, we can perhaps come back but to it. Is it bad well, we now know it's about assessment. <laughs> History will tell us it's about assessment. But we can come back to the language and, and tone and all the rest of it. Um, what happened? It was a very bad assessment. This is a very bad picture as well. But in August 68, the day after Soviet Air Force Day, when historically most of the Soviet military was still drunk, and, and I suspect it was a day chosen on purpose because of that, uh, from these four pockets around the periphery of Czechoslovakia, something like a quarter of a million troops that had been slowly amassing on the border over a period of weeks, uh, invaded the country. You can find photographs online of tanks rolling through the streets of Prague, uh, cars on fire and stuff. And Dubček was taken away uh, to Moscow, given a, a telling off and told not to do it again. And in the aftermath of this, Britain's intelligence community said, well, why did we get this wrong? We knew that there were forces on the border, but we did not know what they were. And for the military who looked at this afterwards, um, their conclusion was this. We knew about the positioning of these forces, but we had no way of knowing until they physically crossed the border what they were doing. Was it simply the aftermath of an exercise? Were they on the border to impose a, a threat to put pressure on the Soviet, on the Czechoslovak government? Or as we now know, were they on the border, engines revving, simply waiting for that decision to go command from the Kremlin. Uh, and there are two interesting footnotes to this one. The first interesting one is well, why did why did the intelligence community get it wrong? What, what was the decision making which they did not grasp at the time? And the reason as we now know that Brezhnev decided to authorize that invasion was that he decided it was much more important to maintain block cohesion and the fact that these other Soviet leaders uh, in other countries were saying we need to stay together and we don't like what's going on. That was more important to Brezhnev than what Dubček was doing in his popularity. And we in the West simply couldn't understand that because that's not how we would have perceived the events. The other interesting footnote in all of this is that the British government had already decided that we would not get involved in any of this. So the footnote is, even though this was an intelligence failure and the crisis was not predicted, even had it been predicted with 100% accuracy, it would not have changed anything that happened afterwards because... It was decided this was a this was a Soviet Eastern European uh, affair and nothing to do with the West. So, what should be expected of a, a strategic-looking intelligence committee? I, I'm not going to go through these in any detail, really. Firstly, there are questions about consensus. The Britain's intelligence approach at that level is based on consensus. The American approach is not. Uh, and it comes up with various interesting questions, for instance, about how do you come up with the best system? Is it better for policymakers to receive a single considered opinion of, of what the community thinks the threat is? Or is it better to have dissenting viewpoints known, even if that gives you totally contrasting assessments? And uh, and Britain now post Iraq has a sort of funny system in the middle. Um, it highlights some of the difficulties with assessment. How do you make a judgment call if actually there's no real intelligence to tell you what's going to happen. Uh, and the problem here was the mirror imaging problem, thinking about what we would do in that scenario, which is not necessarily what the adversary uh, would do. It highlights questions about intelligence success. When something goes wrong, it's very, very obvious to see that. When something goes right and, and an event doesn't take place, how do you really work out that that was all to do with crisis prediction or, or crisis avoidance or, or, or anything else? Uh, and these other bits I, I'll leave for later. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that either. Um, what is it? This is a quote. I, I normally like to, if I give a lecture on this, end with this quote, which I quite like. This was a quote from the Foreign Office. And, and I think we can often get sidetracked with these things because we can tend to dwell on things going wrong. And actually, if we look over the course of history, 
things go wrong much less often than not. It's just that when they do go wrong, they're very, very uh, catastrophic. So a foreign office research analyst said, I, I spent you know, 30 years predicting the future. I only got it wrong twice. One was in 1914, once was in 1939, not predicting the outbreak of either world war, which is fairly significant, I think. So I'm going to pass back. Great, because I've got, I have some comments actually, Mike, on that side, because this is where I struggle with the logic of prediction and taking mm -hmm. action. So you could argue that if people come every year and make warnings about war and people listen to the warnings and they don't happen, yeah, that means it's working. So this, I, I just struggle with, with a statement that um, people who are constantly worrying about things are in some way exaggerating the problem. They might be or they might not be, but but the point is you can't you can't say just because it doesn't happen that, that they were wrong. And going back to um, this one, mm -hmm. I think for me, this this row problems with consensus. We were talking before about it, it's a question of intent, and and all parties are actors in this crisis. Not I mean the Soviet Union, also NATO, the West. So, so a consensus on what one side is going to do, which doesn't include a suggestion of what the other side might do, doesn't really make sense. I don't think it's nearly as useful as it could be. And and I, the more I thought about it, I thought, it's actually what this needs is to say, if you believe that there is a possibility that this might happen, which is what they say, I mean, that, that dreadful line, the possibility cannot be altogether excluded. If you believe that, mm. what action do you need to take in order to make sure that the possibility can be excluded? And so the, 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 the bit that was completely lacking from this process from my perspective is something which says, we can't exclude the possibility, but we think it's unlikely. And you assume that they all say, well, okay, then let's let's just assume it's an exercise. But I assume that there were also some people saying, I think they're going to invade. I think they're going to invade. And it didn't, there was nothing in the in the process. Mm. The process allowed this conclusion rather than allowing a process which says, Jix said we can't exclude it. What do we need to do to make sure that it doesn't happen? And that because I think, I suspect that from this fantastic example that Mike's given, the parallel of Russia invading Ukraine won't have been lost on anybody. Hopefully not. Hopefully you're paying attention. So I'm going to just finish by talking about Russia invading Ukraine, because there are some <clears throat> absolute, I mean, really clear parallels with what happened in Czechoslovakia. Have any of you, <coughs> I'm hoping you're all kind of like, other warning specialists. Do you all know about the great millennium floods in 1997 in Central Europe? Does anyone know about that? Okay. Has anybody watched? <laughs> which case you went. There's a fantastic um, little mini series on Netflix called High Water or Bielka Woda in Polish, which is a dramatization of the real life events in 1997 in July, where there were, between the 3rd and the 10th of July, a massive weather event with, over the first two days, incredibly heavy rainfall in Czechoslovakia, where I think two feet of rain fell in 24 hours, which is sort of two months worth of rain in 24 hours. And the river levels, what you had in a whole series of small tributary rivers, was um, flash flooding and raising of river levels by two to three meters. And that was important. The reason this, this um, mini series on Netflix is so good is because it shows the gradualness of a flood event when you have heavy rainfall in tributary rivers that, have, that, that, that then converge onto bigger rivers. And so between the 5th and the 10th of July, that water traveled from, from the sort of heart of the rainfall, it travels down to the bigger rivers. 
And it started to hit, in particular, the River Oder, which comes down the border of, of Poland and Germany and flow through the middle of Wrocław. And the reason the film is so good is because of the, the menace of the five days as the water level slowly rises and it starts to seep into the cellars of buildings and it starts to flood towns further upstream. And the people in Wrocław are sitting watching it thinking, well, we've got the flood banks, so we'll be fine. And it's gonna flood here and here, but we'll be fine. And, and the, you know, there are a number of dramatical people who come in and say, no, it's not gonna be fine because I've modeled the water and I think it's gonna go here and here and here. And, and the menace builds and builds and builds and things like the flood banks turn out, th there's a big debate about whether they're more useful or, or actually part of the problem because they're stopping the water flooding floodplains at higher up river. Um, and so eventually it, it's a catastrophic event, 140 people, 114 people are, are killed in the floods. And it, as I was watching it, I just thought, it's the same, it's the same with Russia invading Ukraine, because that menace, the sort of seeping, the tributaries, um, has been, had been going on for, for a very, very long time. But where was the warning sounded and, 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 and by whom and, and who heard it? So, so the final part of this is just going to be me talking through the timeline or aspects of the timeline of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I don't know whether this is going to happen. I don't know whether this is going to work, but I sort of kind of like you to interrupt at various stages to think about when you would have sounded a warning and to whom, because we know what happens. But but thinking through, if you had been sitting in all those committee meetings, receiving the intelligence, watching events, when would you have called it? And uh, I encourage you to interrupt me and ask questions about what might have happened then or to suggest things that might have happened then. So we'll start off. Um, 2004, there was a new, it was just like the check, there was a new president. He was, uh, he, this was actually shortly before he was elected president. He was. Wait, yes. Who is that key to me? Country. Well, actually, I'm asking you, I suppose, in this case. So um, it's, it's a good question that it, in you know, Western government systems, there will be a department, as Mike said, in this case, it, 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 it's, it sort of crystallises around a committee in the Cabinet Office, which is, which is responsible for assessing information about threats, state threat, any, any hostile actor, basically, including a state, and providing that information to responsible departments, Foreign Office, Cabinet Office, Prime Minister, Ministry of Defence, Police, whoever needs to take action, but without there being a formal warning system. So, so the risk is that it, that it describes a worsening situation. And it, it, if you think of, in the British system, you have essentially this massive civil service and then you have elected ministers who come and go quite quickly, who are essentially responsible for action. I mean, the whole point is you, you elect somebody to take responsibility for, for setting policy. So that's a complicated tension. So I'm a British citizen. So Fantastic. Yeah. Well, yes, you are. But yours, yes, okay, yes, that's who you can be. Uh, be a British civil servant. Uh, so 2004, uh, Yushchenko, is about to be elected and he is suddenly taken dramatically ill uh, with I mean, various studies have subsequently shown uh, a large dose of a very toxic poison and he's still suffering as a, I mean, he survived but he's still suffering as a result of that. I assume that we're just going to watch that event happen somewhere overseas. August 2008, Russia invaded Georgia which is neighboring country and it annexed South Ossetia which it said the people of which it said wanted to be part of Russia the government of Georgia are you going to sound an alarm <laughs> what sort of alarm are you going to sound uh, no. yes. I mean I think the the question is maybe a, a sort of how prepared should we be essentially um, and whether we should be formulating some sort of intermediate response um, and if nothing is happening even though we're aware of the context we're aware of the historical sort of uh, intentions around this which is frequently overlooked and have been overlooked in the context of Ukraine 
uh, multiple times. Um, I think it, it would make sense to look at this in a medium to longer term uh, vision or trajectory of uh, strategic operations in the region. So that would be a sort of beginning sort of alarm as to the strategic engagement of the military forces of the West. Thank you. Yes. Good. And in practice, I think probably Georgia, I talked very briefly at the beginning about uh, <clears throat> some requirements and priorities, requirements for intelligence collection, how you prioritise that, how you allocate resources. If you think of 2008, we were right in the middle of conflict in Iraq. It was really intense. Terrorist attacks everywhere. We just had um, a series of terrorist attacks in Europe the preceding couple of years. Probably not a lot of resource being put on what's going on in Georgia. And if there had been, I mean, actually, this didn't need intelligence collection as it happened. What it needed was interpretation. And, and, and at, at this early stage, it's quite difficult to say, because they've done this, they might do something else. But there's definitely a set of signals there that, with hindsight, look important. November 2013 in Ukraine, we had the pro-European Maidan uprising, Euro Maidan, or have you say it in Ukrainian, Euro Maidan probably, which was a, a massive popular uprising in support of closer relations with the European Union and rejection of Russia, the Soviet past. Point I'm just going to make clear is the first point. Thank you. Uh, so for me, the question of the first point and the third point, are we arguing that they are domestic Ukrainian matters? Or the second point is clearly a Russian expansionist mission here. And then the point, the first point in particular about the, the assassination attempt and the poisoning, when was it realised that Russia was partly or completely responsible for that poisoning rather than being a uh, you know internal Ukrainian political matter? And you have to factor in as well what UK policy was at these times towards Russia. You know, not necessarily being friendly, but trying to get closer, collaborating on counterterrorism measures. Well, no, because actually I missed, I, one I haven't put here is the, um, no, what's his name? Gone, I've had a complete blank. The, the assassination attempt, the assassination of the dissident guy in Lithuania. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, complete blank. No, that was earlier. Yeah. Sorry, this sorry. Obviously, this is much more professional than it now looks. I've missed that. I deliberately missed that out because I thought we've got so many things. But we had, I think it was two months ago. I'd be wrong. We had, you know, do you know when it was? No, no. Does anyone know exactly when it was? Okay. I, I, I was going to ask. Um, just uh, looking at the timeline, wasn't it two thousand and four that um, I think six or seven former Soviet states joined NATO as well? Yeah, thank you. There's a lot of other, this, this is not perfect. All of these are great suggestions. I will be peppering it with new bad things that have, but it's, it's the, the, going back to that question about had had we connected the assassination attempt on Yushchenko with the, with the Maidan, I think the answer is by that stage, it was quite clear that Russia had, I mean, they, the, Russia was invaded. Russia was meddling constantly in Ukrainian politics, trying to put their man in charge and the next guy so that the other the other president was Yanukovych who was the Russian man and he was ousted on the 22nd of February 2014 so that that um basically those years were years when you had this sort of um what's the right word conflict essentially between the Ukrainian people and the pro-western leaders and other leaders of Ukraine who were essentially put in place by the Russians. And that model, actually, of getting your man in the position of influence is obviously one that we know that Russia has always used. So Yanukovych was Russian backed. Russia wanted their strong man in charge. The, the Euromaidan uprising ousted him. Three days later, Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, Crimea. Are you flashing lots of alarms? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it's a long hour. Just... I, I was just curious why you chose to omit um, 
Putin's speech to the Munich Security Council in 2007, where he spoke about um, NATO enlargement and yeah. American Union. So I didn't choose to admit it. I just I just admitted it because I've got quite a lot of things that I'm going on. But it absolutely, um, I'll stick it in there because you're quite right. I mean, there's with hindsight, there's there is a narrative developing which is quite clear to look at now, and that would include. I kind of shortened this bit because I'm, I've got quite a lot of other bits to put in. <laughs> but over here, we're already. Uh, hello, this the lady at the back. But the other interesting thing about these is these are all observable without intelligence. Yeah, completely. They're just events. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate this exercise, and I think it's um, thought provoking for us. However, I would love to throw kind of a wrench um, in the whole idea of when to sound an alarm or a warning. And that is, there is no clear, an event happens and that's, to me, it's not that direct or linear. And I think all of these events, there should have been strategic actions taking place because there's a clear narrative of patterns. And I think not just here, I mean, you'll, you'll there's many more events that happened. 2014 was particularly, um, a compelling moment in the relationship between Russia and Ukraine in, in the region because of all of the cyber attacks on infrastructure that Russia um, conducted on Ukraine to test the waters. And there's a clear pattern that Russia loves to test the waters, to see what the international community's reaction is, to see what the region's you know reactions are. And the same thing's going around in the Sahel right now there have been patterns, a strong string of patterns of military coup in the Sahel, in West Africa. US intelligence, EU intelligence, they all know that. And then when the, the recent coup in um, yeah. Niger happened in July, intelligence community, the US intelligence community was surprised um, even though there was a clear pattern. So I guess my argument is, there is a clear narrative pattern of um, aggression or things that, you know, okay, something is going wrong or will go wrong. So these alarms should be embedded in the system at different time frames or time visions that, you know, China does a really good job about this. They have a short-term kind of vision, but then they have a very long-term 20 decade strategic vision of how to react to kind of geopolitical events. So I would say maybe our ideas about warnings of geopolitical events should be a little different um, in the way we kind of look at an event, for example, like a tsunami, and then react. I think geopolitical events might have a difference. So could I, I mean, I because I think I've got, I'm going to come on further into this. And I think some of those points you're making are points that actually I'm also trying to make through the process of this. So if we if we kind of I've still got I've still got quite a lot of timeline to go through, um, but but I totally get your point, and that is why I'm trying to say that the problem is at the moment that we've become, in many cases, passive observers of deteriorating situation where it is absolutely clear, definitely in hindsight, what's going on, but actually also. You know, we've got alarms flashing all over the place already. Um, should I keep going for a bit and then we'll see? So uh, so then again, in April, Russian backed separatists sees government buildings in Donbass. So I think here you now have a clear parallel with, with what happened in Georgia, for example, where Russia's using a narrative to take a part of a neighboring country. You had the shooting down of a civilian airliner and bad action about it, it became clear that that was Russians involved in that and the states behaved poorly in response. I think at this stage, by the way, alarms were flashing. I mean, <laughs> you know, alarms were flashing, but you can argue that the conversation that was ineffective was what action should be taken. And you can argue that the reason for that is essentially because although alarms were flashing, 
because there was no sort of form, formal warning system that said, well, let's think, you know, what might this mean? What might they do next? It, 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 didn't, it, it didn't move from being observation of a phenomenon, really, in, in certainly in UK, to, to we have to stop this. Not, not as much as it could have done. Um, that didn't mean that there wasn't a lot of activity to hold people to account, to you know, to, to make sure that the right people were blamed, but it wasn't enough. So then, um, I'm just going to keep going now. 2018 assassination attempt on Sergei Skripal in Salisbury. So I think this did sound an alarm, actually. But it was, again, it, it wasn't an alarm that came through a process. It was an alarm that just sounded because it was incontrovertibly the case that Russia had tried to use a chemical weapon on the streets of a British cathedral city. And that is so far off the scale of, of mad that I think in the UK system, it became clear that we were not dealing with a state that was a rational actor in the way that the thing that's very striking is how difficult it was to persuade even close allies in Europe about the level of threat that Russia posed. I mean, it, to me, you know, people people don't even think about this sometimes in Europe. I mean, it's it's an it's a extraordinary thing for one state to do in another state, actually. So so action happened on the back of that. Um, so I'm hoping that lots of people will be sounding their alarms when they read Putin's essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And I was at an event in Cambridge shortly after this came out. And has anyone heard of Radek Sikorsky? He was Polish foreign minister and then um, he's an MEP now. But he, was, he stood there at the dinner and he had the speech and he said, listen to what he's saying. He's going to invade Ukraine. And the German ambassador was there, also a number of German people, and they said, you know, no, he's not, don't be ridiculous. So there was, it was quite interesting to see that debate, which happens within a state, but happening between people with different perspectives because of different histories, because, you know, obviously different histories with Russia. But Radek said, he's telling us what he's going to do. And I asked him, I said, OK, Radek, what should we do? I, I hear you. I am hearing you communicating the warning. What do you want to happen? And that conversation never really got any further. And I think part of the problem was that even the people here who read this and thought, wow, didn't manage to get to the stage which says, what needs to happen to stop him doing? For, for all the reasons that Mike was talking about with the Czechoslovakia exam, because there are all sorts of other interpretations that say he's just trying to put pressure on them. He's just trying to basically affect their political system so they get rid of Zelensky. Yes, you're, and you're warning. Just, just a very, yeah. very brief point on this. Yeah. I feel like this has continually been the case in this ecosystem when it comes to you know, negotiations around what should be done, particularly in Europe, between Eastern European countries and Western Europe and the US. Mm -hmm. There's a constantly a power relationship at play here, and there's a distrust or a, an underweighting of the understanding that Eastern European countries have mm -hmm. of Russia's intentions mm -hmm. and the historical precedent around that. You know, this is art of war, <laughs> classic, you know, know the enemy. They know the enemy relatively well, but there's a refusal yeah. from the other side to really grapple with that and understand it. And I think that is playing into exactly what you're saying around how they plan for this, whether this actually leads to any action and understanding of the situation. Yeah, I think not. I think on the part of Britain and America, I think there was complete understanding of the threat by this stage. Um, I don't think they did that. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder, because of this, and, and I do research uh, early warning systems in national security and foreign policy, and we've argued this case through um, uh, with regards to both 
uh, at a point actually earlier before the current like last invasion um and then also with regards to the point of cascading kind of you know compounding risk and try to compare it to um tipping point models that you have in the natural sciences maybe and what can be learned from that and i don't know i mean maybe others are smarter in trying to transfer these lessons but it didn't really work uh, in in the cases that we tried and what i'm taking from this and also i mean some of the challenges we discuss and what what the reasons might be here is that is it really about a warning system and and defining a clear threshold after which it, it is a warning? I think in a case like this, I mean, it's fairly easy to say that that that's not what it is, and and it's it's more the question of I mean, we're competing for political capital uh, of leadership, right? Um, and yesterday, actually, a parallel conference at the at King's right now, we did a scenario workshop on the future of now Ukraine and neighboring countries. And what I had the feeling helped much more was um, arguing through the consequences more, right? So making Germans maybe, and I happen to be from Berlin, familiar with the German case, um, understand why the trajectory we are on is so problematic for them um you know because there's this thinking that because i wouldn't even think if you ask the the uh, past leadership um it, hadn't they done anything about it they would be convinced they did something about it right they had a vision for how to engage with russia yeah. we may not agree with yeah. that but it was not like there was nothing um it was the wrong action taken uh, and then maybe arguing through more the consequences because i think what everyone was genuinely surprised about was you know now the unraveling of international norms and effects on the international mm -hmm. systems and so on and that's really something where like oh if we had seen that maybe we would have done something differently so just you know it's a good point I and I think one of the things that, and I, again, I haven't quite finished, but one of the things that comes really clearly out of this is that there was not, across Europe, a shared understanding of the level of threat. And Germany and France, I think, particularly come, they had a different understanding of, of what this threat was. And it comes back, exactly comes back to Mike's discussion about that JIT meeting, which said, what is the intent behind these actions? And, and the point that I'm making is really, if you believe it's a possibility, you should still be saying, what do we need to stop it? So, so for example, I think the next, I know, um, oh yeah, the next slide's got Nord Stream on it, but, but the amount of pressure that had been put on Germany not to finish Nord Stream 2, which was the gas pipeline. And, and that was based on, that was based on all of this. It was based on an understanding of the judgment that Russia posed a serious threat to Ukraine and to Europe, and and it wasn't possible to convince them. And, and you know, I mean, President Trump went quite a long way. I think <laughs> anyway, let's 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 carry on with the timeline and then have this discussion at the end because I think it's it's a really important one. So then, what happens is is the sort of the the, the denouement, the, the the bit which parallels Mike's thing is that it was possible to see from open source a massive build-up to the north and east of Ukraine, which aligned to the major cities, just as you would do if you were going to invade somewhere. And this is taken from the New York Times, but um, and actually I squashed a bit off the top so I couldn't get it all in. But this <coughs> was all happening, this level of analysis, exactly like the Czech one, was happening before the invasion. So at this point, half the commentators were saying, it is absolutely clear what's going to happen. And the other half of the commentators were saying, no, he's doing it to put pressure, don't worry, it's exercise, whatever it was. And by this stage, I think that argument held hardly any water. And the people who thought they were going to invade started taking action. So, the warning was sounded significantly before the invasion in pretty explicit terms by the UK and the US in particular, who had now finally put all these pieces together and who did say, um, in fact, I'll show you the next slide, but I'll show you that. Um, this is Simon Gass, who was then chair of the Joint Strategic Committee Judging an invasion was highly likely. I mean, you know, that's that's a high probability assessment. And others 
France and Germany in particular, saw much of the same intelligence, but thought Mr. Putin was bluffing. Exactly the same as 1968. They couldn't get past the idea that he wouldn't do something so stupid and destructive. That was what, I'm oh, sorry, I spelled destructive wrongly. That was Simon Gass in The Economist recently. So, so the so the EU said, well, we hear what you're saying, but unless you're prepared to share your information, we're not prepared to do anything about it at all. We're not gonna, we're not gonna have a collective response. So you had little bits of action individually. And you basically had what what each of these things did was give signals to Putin. And the signal that it gave was, we're not really gonna be serious about this. And there is no place during this phase of four months where you can see a point which said, given that this warning has been sounded, what, collect, what action do we collectively need to take that has the potential to change what happens next? And that's the bit that I'm most interested in, is, is that, as, as I've heard several of you say, I don't think there's a point in having a warning system. But if you don't have a moment of clarity where you are saying a threshold has been crossed, if you talk in risk mitigation language, these are the risks, and this is the mitigation this is, you know, this is the level of risk we're prepared to tolerate, and these are the mitigations we think are going to keep it there. At a certain point, you need to say this risk has escalated beyond the mitigations. And clearly, hi, yes. Um, Thank you. I, I think it's worth noting these are these are human systems. These aren't natural systems. Yes. So you can you can do that for a flood, and you can predict. Um, but as you mentioned, if you're not dealing with a rational actor and you have uncertainty and you have complexity, um, after all, you have to balance a intervention with the potential enlargement of a Russia-NATO war. And how are you balancing that across multiple member states? Um, whilst at the same time, it doesn't seem as if there was significant China engagement on this realistically where it really have been Chinese intervention when it came to sanctions that would have been remotely useful and there hasn't been a useful dialogue with this on China for quite some time uh, more any concessions made to China so I was, I was sort of curious like yeah. I, I think I agree like early warning signals yeah. are useful but at the end of the day how do you actually then lead that into response especially when you can't predict what will happen next well so so I think that's that's at the heart of it so you're right so you're right that these are human engagements so the point about it being human is that you can change what happens you can't change you, you you can you can't stop a volcano erupting you could take action that would change the risk calculation of the other side. and and that's the the mindset that I think we we find it difficult to get into often now, particularly because we watch things on TV all the time. And so we're not engaging in the real world, but these are the, these are people, everybody's you know, mistakes are actually just people taking decisions. So I guess there, there, is, there is a paucity of evidence. So for example, if you look at internal Russian support for the invasion, and if you look at polling that had been run to see how Western sanctions affected that and how that effectively extended line of support for um, the extension of the war. Like, I wondered to what extent, um, like, for example, you had coordinated influence operations that were used across NATO with thought of economic sanctions as opposed to military means to think about not only the conflict, but like, internal dynamics within Russia as a whole. It, a lot of it seems as if this wasn't particularly thought through when it came to coordinated response. Well, that's about response, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm still focusing on warning. And let me just get, and now I'm, I thought we had loads of time, now we've hardly got any. So can I just get through the last bit and then we'll, so so then, then this was the bit where I think it was clear to a lot of people that, that the denouement was happening. Putin visited Xi for the Winter Olympics. Um, Simon Gass did this thing. President Zelensky went to the Munich Security Conference literally on the eve of the invasion and spoke very powerfully about what was going to happen. Uh, facing ceremony, the Winter Olympics, Russia invades. 
So I suppose my point is that conversation, what can we do to make him change his mind? To make the, you know, what can we do to make Russia think it's not worth it? And this is where your example of Iraq in uh, Iraq and Baby Crazy in 1961 is so good. Because the answer is it's really complicated. But if you are clear about the threat, and I, I personally do think that having a formal strategic warning system, David Oman talks about this as well, gives clarity. It, it, it forces a conversation, which otherwise, in this case, you clearly didn't really have. It gives clarity to the discussion about what do we do about it. And then you can say, well, we decide actually, it's not in our interest to do anything about it really, it's too far away and you know, we're tired. Or you can say, there's a real problem because we know that his justification for doing this is NATO expansion. So one of the options to us would be, for example, to put 500 NATO troops in Kuwait to me to put him off in Haven. But that would also justify his narrative. So that would be harder. So, but, you know, these are all really complicated issues that you need to talk about, not actually just in this instance as, as nation states, but as, as a group of states to say, we know we've got a problem. What is it? What is, I mean, if, are we honestly saying there's nothing we can do given that we're watching this happen? Okay, you know, and that's, 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 the, that's the question. And so I put this map up in the end because this is such a neat parallel to your Czechoslovakian one. Mm. So we do now have so two examples of of what happens when you have a debate about whether or not Russia's going to invade somewhere. And you like to think that the next time when we see them massing their troops on the border of another country, the warning system will go up really clearly and somebody will know that it's their job to listen. I think it's been fascinating. I mean, clearly the, the, that question about whether or not you can warn uh, is not uncontroversial and it's good to hear you all saying you can't but I do disagree I do think having a moment of clarity is really helpful she's been wasting patiently yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you um, as I was listening to this there was sort of quite a few parallels I was drawing and thinking about the context as well so the first thought that came to my head is I'm a public health person so I straight away think about infectious diseases yeah. um, and I was thinking about Ebola we knew Ebola was doing its thing for a long 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 time right and it was happening over there the warning signs were there it was the minute it crossed the border and put us at risk our risk assessment changed and therefore that informed our actions. Listening to this, um, and I remember back when we were dealing with the, um, the Scripple incident, I was in Public Health England back then and, and we were dealing with all of that at the time and we were having these same conversations, like something's got to happen. But then we think about the context because we've looked at this narrative in isolation, but at the same time, what we, we haven't really discussed is all the other things going on, Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan, COVID, et cetera. And whether as part of those risk assessments, it was like, well, with everything else going on and the balance of probabilities and the way in which the public may or may not support this, it is best that we just hang fire until we are certain there is a bigger risk to us. And it was interesting to see what the narrative was, where it was before it was like, it was Ukraine, over there but then when the invasion happened the media started about being ukraine being in europe it's in europe and that suddenly changed that risk perception of the population to then support the action which i think had it been taken that when the warnings were being you know sounded earlier wouldn't have received the same support you know when it was georgia when it's crimea i don't think we'd have seen that same level of support that we saw until the action happened and people felt that personal oh my god this is my doorstep and I wonder whether that's also what sort of was part of the politicians kind of thing, because we can't be in a position to get this wrong during COVID when we're already under pressure and everybody's already on our case. And whether that also informs some of that decision making overall. So I think, I mean, you're absolutely right about um, there's a lot of noise going on all the time in government, you know, government, everything 
but just from, from tiny tactical things that are going to become massive stories to you know major geopolitical acts. And again, this is why I think the only way you can cut through all of that is, I think, is by having the discipline of a warning system, because it then you know, the 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 assessments which inform the sounding of an alarm or an alert in some way, strategic warning, they have to be rigorous. So you can't, you know, you can't sound the alarm for everything when you could sound the alarm for everything, but that, you know, you, you, the way it works in terrorism, you only put the threat level up when you really need to. And and it is a, a clear point. And, and I, I was motivated in part by Dominic Raab saying, no one told me things were going wrong in Afghanistan. And you think, how can you possibly say that? But it was because he received it in this narrative escalatory form, rather than rather than essentially delegating a responsibility to a group of analysts, whether they're looking at Ebola, whether and saying this is the threshold, and after this, I want to know, and you can set that threshold wherever you want. So I I do think in the UK the threshold in Russia was crossed several years before, um, but not in other countries for different reasons. So, I'm not sure. So, um, uh, to make sure I understand you correctly, would be to say we need um, maybe a European level or NATO level coordinated rigorous warning system that then all the countries sit around a table and get the same level of assessment, right? That's that what you're saying? Well, there are NATO warnings. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are bodies. I mean, NATO, you know, sort of. You know, no, 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 no. I know the. I know. <laughs> I know about these bodies. I'm just asking what the yeah. kind of is it about the formalization? Like yeah. what was is the um, what's is the, is the response? Isn't it? I mean, I think the difficulty is that in, intelligence assessments are not policy prescription, and there's a very fine line between providing an assessment yeah. and not advising what should be done about it. And I think often that's where this gap is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there are other interesting examples. Falklands is a classic one of where the community afterwards was criticised for not understanding how your own government's actions would be perceived by, in this case, Argentina. So there, there, there are other examples where actually there were responses, but we didn't understand what they were and how they might change it. I think the difficulty with looking at this in a multinational European NATO way is that all of the information that Suzanne put there was stuff that was publicly, you know, you could see it. You didn't need secret intelligence to see these things. What we don't necessarily know and has been released is what secret intelligence was there that was providing much more pinpointed information about what might or might not be happening, where you could then be much more specific about what you could do to try and stop that. But that assumes there's a political level response that has been agreed upon, and that needs to be done nationally before it can be done internationally. And the problem with sharing intelligence multilaterally, of course, is it can come from a very sensitive source and you might not want to share. So. I think there's no easy answer, but it needs a better system. Mm, because I wanted to ask about that, um, because I, I'm usually also a fan of the formalization argument, right? To say, let's uh, have risk assessments and percentages, not just likely, no, unlikely, or like have it assigned to, you know, Which these things. Yeah, yeah, we don't have, for example, in all the cases, right? Yeah. Um, uh, pushing for that um, and then create a common understanding. Um, and then the second thing is the the difference that you also talked about between um, evidence and then the interpretation and then the point where all the intelligence people I talk to say we don't recommend anything right but there's like uh, clearly like a how do you say like predetermined breaking point in a way no one you know with that gap and then then the next thing is uh, in my opinion like even in the German case I don't think the evidence was so different from the partners that came to a different conclusion, but you would probably in a different country never get the German analytical level. You will always get a level that is already influenced politically, right? And so, um, yeah, that is kind of a reflection of it, the political level. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to the previous question is that you have to, um, if you're looking at this from a national perspective, you have to understand the information from your own national perspective. And so if, if the UK and Germany had exactly the same information, the view would have been different from London or, or Berlin or, you know, so I think that that's the difficulty in these things. Can I just add on, so I think percentages are 
a really false friend in this because if you're if you're called I'm gonna if you're trying to take a decision to warn that someone's going to attack you what you really all you really need to know is is it more likely than not mm -hmm. it's the 50 percent argument because you've got to decide whether you're going to take action or whether you're not going to take action and for me the over engineering or over scientific whatever the word is over scientification of this process as, as a gentleman over there said it's a human process if you think it is more likely than not that state a is going to invade state b you have to decide what you're going to do if you think it's more likely than not that an airplane is going to be blown up tomorrow it's no good saying well it you know it's 45 percent likely so we decided to do not you know whatever it is you you have to take action or it's going to happen. It's all about risk at the end of the day, isn't it? Man, how do you manage risk in athletics? Sorry, you're going to this. So I may be making this a little too simplistic, but I'm trying to connect up the topic of this discussion with the topic of the conference. And basically what I'm thinking here is that you almost need a system of outlook, watch, and warning as it relates to the potential for a political event, similar to the way you would for a tornado outbreak. Exactly. And as the information changes, you adjust your outlooks. When the level of concern starts rising, you go into a watch. And then at some point, when the tornado is in the next county or when the opponent is in the next state, that's usually way too late for a warning. So hopefully that, in my mind, wasn't oversimplifying it because what we're also dealing with, especially coming from the United States, we're relying on our political system to be monitoring all this stuff. And we're not thinking of what's going on. We're reading about it in the newspapers, at least for my own self, and thinking, well, will he or won't he? Exactly. We're totally passive. Yes. And... Absolutely amazing. I didn't have enough stuff to worry about before, and now I've got this to be thinking about all the time. But thank you, thank you. How's the UK? We don't get tornadoes as much as we <laughs> Never, never, never say that. Well, it's like a water tornado. Oh, right. Another point of this is kind of how, I mean, I, I agree, formal warning uh, structures are very useful and good. And then, um, but I think a lot of it is how they're taken notice of, and it's ensuring that people who are in a position to make a decision are actually taking notice of it. Um, and I think in government machinery, especially when it comes to analysis, there is an avalanche of assessments that's constantly coming across desks. And I think from my own experience, what JTAC has done, their warning system seems to have been quite successful in terms of gaining traction and being read. Um, so it'd be interesting to get an insight on how kind of, you know, the marketing push, if you want, uh, for want of a better phrase, would be interesting uh, to, to hear about. Um, so, yeah, I think perhaps it's, it's a question of shifting perhaps away from just a constant <laughs> slew of assessments to using an actual system that uses quantifiable numbers that mean something. Um, but how you do that is quite difficult. I, I, for me, I, just, I, I, just, I just think that um, this is the discipline of having, as an analyst, having to decide when something's beyond tolerances is so important. And it's really difficult, but if you don't have, if there's no system at all, if there's no responsibility on the analytical body, to, to to communicate that, then you do end up just with a with a with a narrative, and you're you're essentially you're saying to the busy politician, you do your analysis and work out when it's done, and that's there's no you know there's no point of that. You can't just keep sending stuff mm -hmm. to politicians saying, oh, it's looking really bad in Russia again. You know, you have to have a point where the where the where the communication to the politician says, if we you know. This it, if we keep doing what we're doing in brackets, this is now looking likely to happen. This we've changed, something's changed. 
We need to stop. Yeah, yeah we do need to stop. We've finished. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid we haven't got any. Oh god, I'm dreading looking. Is at there them. anything online? Or... Uh, no questions online. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, we finished. So now you're still doing our drawing. Uh, yeah. If there's still like a moment, time, I'm just gonna. Thank you all for clearing the page. Engaged, lively audience, which is what we want to do. Maybe we need something to think about. A requirement. <laughs> no, because there isn't an answer, and we're doing this deliberately just to get a conversation going. I'm suddenly thinking that just like we have a storm prediction center. Yeah. <laughs> there, there needs, and hopefully already exists somewhere, a war prediction center. Well, that's, that is basically. Oh, wow. You want that? We said it. Yeah, I think I need. Is that the microphone? Uh, I think it's one. Oh, this, this one? Oh, I have two. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I take yeah. this yeah. one? The uh, UNDPPA. Hey. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> so I was uh, trying to capture this like very complex uh, conversation about all these topics of um, foreign national security policy, and I'm going to zoom in into some of the parts. Um, so in the beginning. <laughs> In the beginning, uh, you were talking about the selection and monitoring of indicators. So where does information come from? What to watch? And the governments watching each other. Also, the the risk of instability. Um, then the prioritization of threats, um, which are then relayed to other analytical bodies. I've just put down this uh, the triangle uh, that you've drawn with these puzzles because they grasp into each other. There's no formal warning system, as you said. Uh, then the um, warning um, communication, how does it work usually? And the uh, out, the effect um, yeah, affecting the outcome of uh, by early warnings. So the question of fact and the question of intent. And I want to include this also, so the consensus, um, all the different viewpoints. So what would my adversary do? A bit like in chess, uh, that was my, my the idea I got from this, but also the idea that you could not stop natural catastrophic events. This is about people and politics. And then I've added just some of the points because this was very complex. I'm not an expert on these points. So if there's something like um, you would like to add here, um, please feel free to do so. Um, but the, the different examples that you mentioned, and then I tried to put down also the timeline on the bottom here, when would you actually sound the alarm with all the different points, and I've added all the different points in between, because there's lots of things happening in between, which have not been mentioned because uh, due to the time. Um, and in the end, uh, the idea to have an overarching warning system to for also for this, um, which then raises an alarm. And I've just added this last point here. What are the tipping points um, also like from yeah. natural sciences, uh, as you said before? Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.